This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on Insurance. I'm an attorney who has retired from the practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant, an expert witness, an author, and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to talk about the equitable remedy of subrogation, which is available to all insurers whether they have a specific clause in their insurance contract allowing them to subrogate or not. The equitable doctrine places the subrogee, the person making the payment, in the precise position of the one whose rights are subrogated. That is, the insurance company paying a claim is the subrogee, and if the claim was the result of some tortious conduct by a third party, the insurer as the subrogee can then sue the third party in the name of its insured or in its own name to recover whatever was paid. Subrogation is the remedy called into existence for the purpose of enabling a party secondarily liable, but who has paid the debt, to reap the benefit of any securities which the creditor may hold against the principal debtor, and by the use of which the party paying may thus be made whole. In an insurance situation, the insurance company, after it pays a loss to its insured, obtains by equity, that is fairness, or contract, the right to an assignment from its insureds up to the amount paid of the insured's rights against third parties responsible for the loss. Texas law, like every other jurisdiction, recognizes three sources of subrogation rights, equitable, contractual, and statutory. Every claim investigated, therefore, by a professional claims person requires a thorough investigation of all subrogation possibilities. The insurance claims person who ignores the possibility of a subrogation is completing only half of a thorough investigation. The remedy arises from tort, contract, or equitable remedies available to the insured as the result of a loss that after the insurer pays must be assigned to the insurer. The adjuster or claims professional who fails to secure the rights of subrogation are taking from the insurer a profit center where the amounts of loss paid can be reduced. Now this right is ancient. In 1748, for example, the House of Lords in England decided in a case called Randall v. Cochran that an insurer for an English ship that was taken by the Spanish was permitted to bring suit in the name of its insured against the administrators of a public prize fund collected by the British government from the sale of captured Spanish ships. The Lord Chancellor, quoted in an article by John J. O'Brien, said, quote, The plaintiffs had the plaintest, plainest equity that could be. The person originally sustaining the loss was the owner, but after satisfaction made to him, the insurer, the assured stands as trustee for the insurer in proportion for what he paid. The earliest master of insurance law in England was Lord Mansfield, who addressed subrogation in a case called Mason v. Sainsbury in 1782. Rioters had ransacked Mason's house, and his insurance company paid the claim. At the time, there was a riot act of 1714, that provided a means to recover damages against the local administrative district. The insurance company pursued a recovery action against the administrator 
in the name of its insured and collected the benefits. Traditionally, an insurer that pays its insured's claim is entitled to recover the payment from the third party who caused the insured's covered loss. This concept is called subrogation and can arise by contract statute statute or equitable principle. As early as 1888, the U.S. Supreme Court found that equitable subrogation was a well-recognized doctrine. The Supreme Court stated the historical rule that, quote, the equitable assignee of a chose in action has the right to go into court of equity to have his interest therein established and when so established, he will have the right to complete relief in the same action by decree of the specific performance of the contract. This was Aetna Life versus Middle Sport, a 1888 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. Regardless, the Supreme Court found that the insurer acted as a volunteer and ruled against its right of subrogation since he ha it had no obligation to actually pay its insured. The U.S. Supreme Court stated the basic rule of subrogation as follows, quote, Hence, it has often been ruled that an insurer who has paid a loss may use the name of the assured in an action to obtain redress from the carrier whose failure of duty caused the loss, but is equally well settled that the right by way of subrogation of an insurer upon paying for a total loss of the goods insured to recover over against the carrier is on that right which the assured has, and that accordingly when a bill of lading provides that the carrier when liable for the loss shall have the full benefit of any insurance that may have been effected upon the goods, this provision is valid as between the carrier and the shipper, and that therefore such provision limits the right of subrogation of the insurer upon paying the shipper the loss to recover over against his carrier. Close quote. Generally, to protect its subrogation rights, an insurer may seek intervention in the insured's lawsuit against the legally responsible party, or may wait to seek the funds from its insured who is required to hold, in trust, any funds it recovered from the tortfeasor, or by contract to reimburse the insurer. The purpose of subrogation is to prevent the insured from obtaining a double recovery, and thus being unjustly enriched, and to place the responsibility for paying the loss on the party who caused the loss. The right of subrogation is not new in South Dakota a half century ago. The South Dakota Supreme Court stated, quote, it is well settled rule of law that an insurer is entitled to subrogation either by contract or in equity for the amount of the indemnity paid. This was Parker v. Hardy, a 1950 decision of the South Dakota Supreme Court. Though frequently repeated, that sentence is seldom parsed. Subrogation can arise out of two sources. First, the parties can agree to create a contractual right of subrogation. This is commonly done in insurance policies. In addition, equity can require the creation of subrogation based upon the circumstances even without a contractual obligation. In applying the made whole doctrine to preclude the insurer from accessing funds for which it was competing with its own insurer, the Wisconsin Supreme Court stated that under Wisconsin law, the test of wholeness depends on whether the insured has been completely compensated for the elements of damages, not merely those damages for which the insurer has indemnified the insured. The made whole rule 
is a common law exception to an insurer's subrogation rights. As applied in California and most states, the rule generally precludes an insurer from recovering any third-party funds unless and until the insured has been made whole for the loss. The applicability of the doctrine generally depends on whether the insured has been completely compensated for all elements of damage, not merely those for which the insurer indemnified the insured. In many jurisdictions, courts hold that parties may avoid the made whole exception by contract. California courts have recognized that the made whole exception does not apply if the insurer participated in prosecuting the claim against the third party. A separate and independent limitation on subrogation and reimbursement rights provides that an insurer's reimbursement from its insured is subject to the insurer bearing a pro rata portion of the insured's attorney's fees and costs incurred in it obtaining recovery from the third party. A transfer of rights provision in a general liability insurance policy which gave an insurer subrogation rights did not abrogate the mail hold doctrine and therefore an insured had priority to receive any indemnification payment from a third party before the insurer where the transfer of rights provision only allowed the insurer to recover payments it had actually made. Indemnification payment to the insured was not enough to satisfy the insured's self-insured retention obligation, such that the insurer had yet to provide payment and provision did not address the priority of reimbursement, nor did it expressly abrogate the male whole doctrine. Pennsylvania law, requires that a party suffering damages be made whole before an insurer is entitled to subrogation. Some insurance contracts, however, allow an insured to waive the insurer's right of subrogation under certain circumstances. For example, the insured is entitled to waive the insurer's right of subrogation against its lessor if it is damaged as a result of some action of the lessor to the leased property. Similarly, in a contract between contractors, builders, and owners, a waiver of subrogation can deprive the insurer of its rights based upon the contract and the agreement in the insurance policy allowing the insured to waive subrogation before the loss but not after. Some contracts even allow the insured to waive subrogation after a loss, for example in the case of a lessor and lessee. These clauses must be read and understood before an attempt is made to collect under the right of subrogation, and therefore the insurance claims professional must not only understand the obligation of an insured to allow the insurer to subrogate, but must also understand the existence of waivers of subrogation and the contracts between the insured and the third party. Sometimes, if there is no waiver of subrogation clause in the insurance policy, but the insured in a contract with a third party waives the insurer's right of subrogation, the insurer can refuse to pay the entire claim or seek reimbursement from the insured who waived subrogation without a right to do so. This was a California Court of Appeal decision called Liberty Mutual versus Outfillage. Subrogation is an important 
part of every claims investigation and should be conducted carefully and professionally. This video was adapted from my book, Zalma on Insurance Claims, Part 107, Second Edition, which is available from Amazon.com as both a paperback and a Kindle book. If you found this video to be useful or interesting, please forward it to your colleagues. It's free. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, and my blog so that you can learn about future blog postings and future videos. Thank you for your attention.